Head over to StuDoesMerch.com. Get the Anyone But Biden 2024 merch line. Uh, it's available at StuDoesMerch.com. The code is Stu10 to save 10%. If you're watching on YouTube, like the video right now. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. Do all the things. Dan Andrus is here to talk about Nancy Mace and Richard Dawkins and a whole lot more. Uh, the Supreme Court has been in the news a lot lately, so we'll make it really easy and let you know whether you're supposed to hate them or love them right now. It's hard to figure out. But we start by doing the education of Kamala Harris. Yes, Kamala Harris has been in the news a lot lately. She's been out there talking. They're letting her speak. Yes, she's been talking a lot about education. And this story sort of bubbled up the week I was on vacation and I didn't get a chance to talk about it. But I want to highlight this because there were two things that I think are super important that came out of this. Now, of course, you will be unsurprised to hear that none of that has to do with anything Kamala Harris actually said because... When she talks, she's an absolute idiot. I mean, you, when she's improving, it is 20 minutes of nonsensical Veep thoughts, right? Veepthoughts.com, by the way, to see all those clips. Uh, it's just nonsense. It's just word salad blathering. That's usually what she does when she's uh, on sort of the uh, un, unscripted side. When she's on the other side, when she's got a teleprompter in front of her, you can always tell because she... It comes off as really fake. I mean, she's just really bad at this. Um, now, this goes back to the Florida education program. You remember there was, to kind of give you the, the brief history, in case you didn't follow this, it, you have the, there was a, a standing uh, incoming um, uh, education program to teach about black history in Florida. And when people went through it, including Ron DeSantis, it had stuff like critical race theory and Marxism and, you know, LGBTQ issues in it. Like it was just uh, queer theory was one of the things that was in it. And so he was like, look, we're not going to do this. We're going to do real history here. So he got a bunch of experts together. They put together a, a, a curriculum and outlined it. And um, while they were doing that, people on the left were there able to raise objections if they had any issues. They didn't do that. They let it go all the way through. And then they pulled one line out of this curriculum and tried to make it seem like Florida was teaching kids that slavery was actually pretty good for slaves. It was beneficial. Uh, here's the one line. It was instruction includes how slaves developed skills that in some instances could be applied for their personal benefit. Now, this got, uh, not authentically, but this got Kamala Harris up all, uh, got her cackles uh, all arise, uh, all, uh, or, um, what do they call, what's the phrase? I don't know, something about cackles. Anyway, so she got all upset about it, and she decided to go down to Florida and fly down to Florida to make this big speech about how uh, terrible Florida was for teaching everybody that slaves actually had it pretty good and, and life was pretty uh, beneficial for them. Here's a clip of that nonsense. In this moment, we even see extremists ban books True. and attempt to erase and even rewrite the ugly parts of our history. Lying like crazy here. Right here in Florida. Clapping for the line. <laughs> How like, excited she is. To be her in this moment. It's pathetic. Right here in Florida, they plan to teach students that enslaved people benefited from slavery. Do they? They mm. insult us in an attempt to gaslight us. Like how red in is an this attempt speech? to divide and distract our nation with unnecessary debates. You're the one that brought this up. What are you talking about? Ooh. And now they attempt to legitimize these unnecessary debates with a proposal that most recently came in of a politically motivated round table. I'm well, I'm here in Florida. And I will tell you, there is no round table, no lecture, no invitation we will accept to debate an undeniable fact. There were no redeeming qualities of slavery. I mean, she is, it's, it's almost impossible to express how bad she is at this. And how, how anyone could fall for that and feel like, oh gosh, well that's a, that was a really good point. Does anyone believe it? I mean, just on its face, isn't there that test where you say, 
I mean, is that even rash, possibly believable? Well, apparently no one really applies that test. She decided to double down on it. She tweeted about it as well. There were no redeeming qualities of slavery. Now, of course, Ron DeSantis decides to uh, fight back a little bit here. Uh, he ripped Kamala Harris over the hoax Florida curriculum claim and went back and forth with some reporters. And, and what's interesting about this is, of course, most of these reporters just believe it immediately, like she's telling the truth. We'll get into whether she is here in a second. But, like, wouldn't you have a moment where you'd question this or at least know the details of the argument when you went up against Ron DeSantis himself? Here's how that went. Were there beneficial aspects to slavery? It's not what the curriculum says. With what the do you think? With the curric- no, if there's, no, it's not. And the curriculum is very clear. You have, I think it's like 200 plus pages of all kinds of stuff that you can't read that. Have you read it? So what's your opinion? Have you read it? What's you your, haven't, I'm you haven't, you, your opinion. But, but you haven't read it, so I'm just, just making that clear. That makes it very clear about the injustices of slavery in vivid detail. So anyone that actually read that and then listens to Kamala would know that she's lying. And that particular provision about the skills, that was in spite of slavery, not because of. The AP course has made that same point. Other courses have made that same point. Nobody said anything um, about that. And Dr. Allen and those people will say, look, this is what was used post bellum when these folks were doing stuff. So that was very, very clear. And I would just say, you know, people can can read it, but but they did a very good job on it. And there can be no um, confusion about where they would come down on that. Now, of course, the guy who was in charge of developing this was African-American. It's quite clear. Uh, And DeSantis alluded to it a little bit there that the point of this, and, and you can make the argument, I guess, hey, maybe just Just leave that line out. Why have the controversy? Uh, It had been something that had been in the educational process for a very long time. Um, But the point of it was that slaves that were in this era, many of them were able to overcome. This is this is a an argument about them overcoming and using this time to be able to come up with incredible uh, skills and uh, help them in their lives. It wasn't because slavery gave them this great opportunity. That's not what it's talking about at all. It's like they overcame these terrible consequences and still came out uh, achieving great things in their lives. It's not a, it's not a it's not a praise of slavery. And of course, everyone knows it's not a praise of slavery because there's nothing to be praised in slavery, which I might uh, argue, uh, remind everyone was a centralized government program uh, put in place by a strong central government uh, that was something that I don't support at all. I know the left supports a government strong enough to implement something like slavery, but I don't. So I don't know, again, how that works. By the way, again, something that was alluded to uh, by DeSantis in his commentary, this had been something that had been in the AP course on slavery for a very long time, a course that Kamala Harris herself had praised in the past, VP Kamala Harris backed National High School course about slaves' skills before Florida controversy, um, even though it was almost identical to what she now says is replacing history with lies. The College Board's 2023 AP African American Studies course includes a lesson about slaves learning specialized trades that they use to provide for themselves once freed, recognized by Harris earlier this year as part of American history. But none of this makes any difference. It's not real, right? Um, now, of course, Ron DeSantis came out and said, hey, all right, well, you know so much about this, Kamala. Well, let's debate it. Come on down. We'll debate it right now. Um, she's, he said uh, he's going to stand his ground, and he'd invited Harris to debate, debate him over Florida's new African-American history uh, curriculum. Kamala Harris says of no. Uh, she will not do that, of course. Uh, she says Kamala Harris continues attacking Florida black history, doesn't want an unnecessary debate. And of course, by unnecessary, she means one that she would lose. Uh, in the middle of the debate, I, I assume she would get on her phone and uh, start charging it and never answer any of the questions. I think that's, that's how that works. Um, now, what's fascinating about this, and this is the last minute I'm going to spend about her actual claims, which are so idiotic, you know, I'm sure you've heard them dispatched multiple times. Uh, Charles C.W. Cook did a really good job of this. Kamala Harris is brazenly lying about Florida's uh, slavery curriculum. And he wrote a story. I have it all here. Uh, it's long. Uh, you know, it goes through and it has uh, all the details on the curriculum. Uh, there are 191 times the curriculum mentions slavery. And he lists all of them. 
So you don't even have to read the whole curriculum, which could be a little bit long for you. This is only about uh, 20 pages of, of things about slavery. Um, let me give you some of the examples. Um, among many, many other things, it includes sections on the conditions of African Americans during their passage to America. Those weren't, those weren't good, those conditions. The living conditions of slaves in British North American colonies, not good. The Caribbean, Central America, and South America, including infant mortality rates. The harsh conditions and their consequences on British American plantations, including undernourishment, climate conditions, conditions, infant and child mortality rates of the enslaved versus the free, the harsh conditions of the Caribbean plantations, including poor nutrition, rigorous labor, labor and disease. Do these things sound positive to you? How the South tried to prevent slaves from escaping and their efforts to end the Underground Railroad, the overwhelming death rates caused by the practice, the many ways in which Africans resisted slavery, the ramifications of prejudice, racism and stereotyping on individual freedoms, the struggle, struggles faced by African-American women in the 19th century as it really relates to issues of suffrage, business, and access to education, on and on and on and on and on it goes. I mean, it really does list all, all of these things. All of them, of course, negative. The one line that they highlight out of this talks about how these skills were acquired by slaves and then wound up using them to their personal benefit. Something that speaks to the incredible uh, bravery and um, uh, amazing character of people who went through these terrible conditions described throughout the entire curriculum and were able to overcome them and wind up doing positive things for themselves later in life. In other words, they took really po you know a couple of positive things out of a really terrible, terrible scenario. That's something to praise about slaves, not to praise about slavery. I, you can't read it any other way if you read it. And that's the thing here. One of the most important things to take out of this is something that is fundamentally broken in our system right now. Something that is the, the, maybe the biggest issue when it comes to the problems we have in our politics right now. And it's, a, it's something that people like Kamala Harris and their staffs get in rooms and decide to, to, to look at the world in a different way. We would all say, hey, when we're going to talk about something, should we talk about something that is true or false? Is it true? It's a big question. I mean, you know, when you see this sometimes, a claim comes across, maybe it seems too good to be true. Maybe it's something that seems like, I don't know, is this, is this true? Like, I, it seems like uh, maybe someone's playing to my side of the argument. And we question those things. I think that's one of the reasons you probably watch this show, because I try to do that stuff. And I know, reading your comments and your emails, you guys do that stuff a lot, too. There's some stuff that pops up from the right, and we're like, eh, is that is that true? I want to make sure it's true before we start uh, touting it and running around uh, claiming these things. But there's, that's one question that I think politicians used to ask themselves. There's a new question they ask themselves, and this is the fundamental problem I'm talking about. It's this battle between the question, is it true, and is it plausible? And this is a really important distinction to understand when you watch politicians like Kamala Harris bl blunder herself through issues like this. She knows what she's saying isn't true. She knows this curriculum does not, it does not tell people there are benefits to slavery. It does not say, hey, slavery was kind of good. It doesn't say, hey, slavery is something we should reconsider. Maybe it's something we should bring back someday. She knows that is not true. Everyone around her that is making this claim knows it is not true. That's not the question they ask themselves, though. They ask themselves, is it plausible? Given the fact that we've sold Ron DeSantis as Satan for the past three years, as Ron Death Santis, could our audience plausibly believe he would try to tell people that slavery was beneficial? Is it plausible? Could some of our pe the people who donate money and are on our email list plausibly believe this? We know it's not true, but could we make them believe it is? Could they plausibly fall for this line of argument? And the answer they came up with on this one was yes. And for them, it's an easy sell because they have people like the media to, to go in there and argue these things for them. The, I mean, you listen to the questions coming to Ron DeSantis by that one reporter. It's obvious he had absolutely no idea 
what was in the curriculum. But he had heard this one claim, and because he hates Ron DeSantis already, he just assumes it's true. It was plausible to him. So he went there and made an ass out of himself in front of the entire country. This stuff happens to people all the time. But once you've made an ass out of yourself in front of the entire country, the good thing about being a liberal is you can go back and complain about it, and everyone else who also hasn't read the thing that they're talking about can back you up. So you don't feel like such an ass. This is a wonderful, wonderful thing, um, at least for your short-term comfort level. I mean, it makes you a moron. So, I mean, I'm not a long-term how comfortable you are with that. Maybe you don't care. Uh, but is it true versus is it plausible? And you see these arguments come down all the time where we come back and we say, wait a minute, they're not looking at this, and here's all the stuff that they have wrong with it. And it doesn't matter because they don't care if it's true. None of this matters to them. They just want, they just hope that enough people will believe it's plausible. Have they set the foundation that the person making that statement is evil enough that they could believe something like, hey, slavery is beneficial? I mean, look, there are a lot of claims out there. There are a lot of crazy ideas out there. But do you really believe a guy who just won an incredibly high percentage of minorities and won by 20 points in his state actually believes that slavery was good. Now, of course, he's on record saying the opposite a thousand times. And everything about this tells you that this is just an obvious political attack. But when you have the media on your side and you've built this foundation that, that Ron DeSantis is Satan, you can somehow convince yourself that this is a good thing to do. And I honestly have listened to, you know, over vacation and over the past week, tons of mainstream reporters do exactly what that reporter did in, in, tech, in, uh, in, in Florida with Ron DeSantis. He, they just regurgitate what Kamala Harris was saying with no critical thought whatsoever because they don't want to have the critical thought. That's what's important to understand. The second thing that's important to understand here is the question of why is Kamala Harris out so publicly all of a sudden? She's kind of everywhere all of a sudden. On this issue, a very high profile thing. Now, in previous elections, they've kind of rolled her out to try to make arguments, um, you know, to to gain minority uh, voters and their dollars. Uh, so that's sort of in line with what they've done in previous elections. But it does seem more prominent right now. They basically hide her all the time. And all of a sudden, she's out there again. And you're starting to see media coverage sort of echo this idea. Kamala Harris seems to be stepping into her 2024 role. Uh, Democrats would prefer Kamala Harris over Joe Biden as the 2024 nominee. A new poll shows, and it's worth asking the question and, and thinking about this for a moment. You wonder if Democrats are thinking, hey, we've got a lot of this stuff with Hunter Biden and Joe Biden going to coming on. It does seem like it's getting closer and closer to Joe by the day. We're starting to see it with the American people and poll after poll say we think something is actually going on here. 60 and 70 percent of people are saying we think maybe Biden uh, is corrupt and has participated in some of this corruption stuff. Should we be prepared? Should we be prepared with somebody to back this person up? I mean, look at the Mitch McConnell stuff, which also happened when I was on, on vacation. I mean, Mitch McConnell should not be in the Senate after something like that. He, you know, just like Dianne Feinstein shouldn't be in the Senate, Mitch McConnell should not be in the Senate after something like that. There's obviously something seriously wrong with him when you're in the middle of a speech and you just stop for, for a minute and just stare. Like, that shouldn't be somebody who is, is, he should step down immediately. And I think it's quite clear he should. Everybody knows it. Uh, the same thing with, uh, you know, uh, Dianne Feinstein. And if Joe Biden has a moment like that, he's had similar moments. He has them all the time. But if he had one that was that bad, he'd be toast in this election. They have to have somebody there. They have to have somebody in the bullpen ready to go in case Joe Biden uh, stumbles. And I mean, that could be a literal stumble on stage. It could be a brain freeze like we saw with with Mitch McConnell. It could honestly be um, this scandal getting closer and closer to him. They have to have somebody ready to go. And it seems like they are now trying to elevate Kamala. And you might say everyone hates Kamala. And that's true. She's one of the most uh, unpopular vice presidents in history. But when you look at the, the details, you know, Gavin Newsom's not ready. He's an embarrassment. People don't really like Gavin Newsom when they see him over a long period of time. The, the only logical thing to do for them if Joe Biden were to drop out was to put Kamala Harris in. That's really all they'd have. So they better pump her up now. They're giving her tasks like this to try to make this easy. She still sucks at them, but, you know, arguing against slavery being beneficial is a nice, easy play that any 
idiot could, could get through, even though it's an obvious lie. So we will look at uh, this and see if there's any more uh, breadcrumbs here on this trail to see if, if this is real, if they really are prepping her because they are worried about Joe Biden going down. We'll talk a little bit more about the presidential election with Dan Andros coming up here in just a second. Think about the, the uh, supply chain. If you, if you think about trying to get a, a TV or some electronics or a car from overseas uh, over the past uh, few years, you've realized how hard that can be. And that can happen with, edu- with our uh, medication as well. Medications almost all produced overseas. And if you think about the medication that you need for just basic stuff, antibiotics, right, to knock out uh, basic infections and minor sicknesses that we think of as minor now, but they weren't minor in the history of man, before we had things like antibiotics, these things were major things, respiratory infections, sinusitis, skin infections. These things took out people all the time. Now it seems like, ah, it's no big deal. We'd have antibiotics. Well, what if that supply chain breaks down? You should be prepared. JaceMedical.com has your preparation all ready for you. Uh, You can enter the code STU at checkout. You'll save with that code. Now, they they can give you the Jace case. This will get you through, I think, five uh, courses of antibiotics in case you have an illness. Uh, It's easy. Or if you're traveling, you need that uh, while you're traveling. Um, Also, uh, they have a year-long supply of these basic medications that you need on a daily basis. Be prepared. Don't get caught. It's promo code STU at jacemedical.com, J-A-S-E medical.com. It's the Jace case from Jace Medical. Joining us now is Dan Andros. He's the managing editor of faithwire.com and host of Quick Start, the podcast where you can subscribe to wherever you get your podcast. Dan, how's it going? It's going great. Uh, Well, I want to talk to someone from faithwire.com and immediately start with an atheist, Um, (laughs) Richard Dawkins, who I don't know, I I want to say he's the most famous atheist out there, although there's plenty of famous atheists. He's just famous for his atheism. Uh, Plenty of the people we know who are famous for other things are atheists too. But Richard Dawkins is uh, probably the most ideologically famous uh, atheist. And he was talking about the transgender movement recently. And I I don't know, this is interesting because you kind of think that, well, it's all these religious nutjobs who can't, who are upset about uh, boys being called, uh, you know, girls and girls being called boys. But Richard Dawkins, here's part of his commentary, sex really is binary. You're either male or female. And it's absolutely clear you can do it, uh, uh, you can do it on chromosomes. To me, as a biologist, it's distinctly weird that people can simply declare, I am a woman, though I have a penis. This uh, seems to be common sense, even though it's coming from a very strange source. Well, yeah, and it's, and it's honestly, it's good to see and like, Look, I don't agree with Richard Dawkins on almost anything. <laughs> and, but when you when you see people who are in the follow the science crowd and then I mean, Neil deGrasse Tyson just went viral for a clip where he was saying that you can be you can wake up one day and feel like you're 80 percent male and 20 percent female. And that's fine. And, and how can you deny that? And I, I'm like, you're Neil deGrasse Tyson. You're the science guy. Like, well, you guys are supposed to look at this stuff. In literal black and white, when it comes to science, this is what it is. This is how we can tell stuff. Yeah. And so, and so anyway, so I appreciate when somebody like, uh, you know, not that I'm going to agree with Richard Dawkins, but I appreciate when he knows this is going to anger all of the, um, you know, woke atheists in his following. He knows it's going to anger them, but he's willing to say it. And that's, that's what I appreciate about, about this commentary. Yeah. You know, I think the, the, it's okay to, uh, to, ha- to, to, to acknowledge, for example, what you mentioned with Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's true in some ways, right? Like, it, you may feel like you're 80% woman. You may feel like you're 20% male. But that doesn't make it true. That right. doesn't make it, that's not a scientific fact in any way. A feeling is a feeling. And while it might be important <laughs> to you and your family and your friends around you who want to know how you feel about stuff, it's not important at all to a scientist who's trying to measure reality. Yeah. Well, and and Tyson ended his commentary by saying, what do you care about it? What are you so mad about? I don't care. There have been (laughs) transgenders around for years and years and years, and no one's cared at all about them. No one said one thing. The reason we care is because currently y'all are shoving it down our throats and telling us we have to accept this. Yeah. 
we have to say this is beautiful and wonderful when there's some dude dressed in underwear, women's underwear, twerking in front of kids. And I'm you're telling me I have to say this is good or I'm the bigot here. Right. That's why it matters, Neil. <laughs> and and uh, in addition to that, it matters because it's now being targeted at children, right? Like, I mean, like we yeah. can all say, hey, I don't care if you go to a strip club. And, you know, we might say it's a bad idea, but like you get to go do what you want to do, even if you think it's a bad idea. I don't care if you drink too much. I might say, hey, it's not healthy for you, but like, you know, you do what you do. It's your choice. When they're trying to affect children who are now being forced into, we talked to a guy earlier this week whose uh, son is being raised as someone who's a non-binary, even though uh, the son himself says he's a boy. The mother wants to raise him as someone who's non-binary. Uh, and the kid is three years old. Three. Now, we are talking about affecting little children with decisions that may wind up affecting their entire lives. We're talking about physical changes, hormonal changes that just, you know, can destroy their development. And all of this is going down and we're being told by people who at the same time will yell to us about the science that this is the only way to go. That, that I mean, it is really, really a disturbing time. It is a disturbing time and it's just this complete unhinging I mean, we're seeing it in politics from the Constitution, and we're seeing it in culture uh, in regards to basic common sense things. You know, Stu, one of the things that has really been a head scratcher to me is the hospitals now, well-known mainstream hospitals that are rushing to do gender affirming care. That's actually shocking to me because usually the doctors, the, the experts in this area that know this stuff, that know gender dysphoria is a mental issue. For them to latch on to this, the, like you said, the feelings type crowd and, and go along with this, main ho hospitals like CHOP here in Philadelphia, which is a great hospital otherwise, are doing this stuff and they're doing uh, all this stuff within the schools to try to educate the, the local people here on gender affirming care. And it's just, that's what's surprising to me is that people who should know better and do know better are going along with something because of feeling. Yeah, and, and honestly, the, in addition to that, how is it possible that it's called CHOP? I mean, I, I mean well, just, it's, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, I know. They, they're, they're leading themselves into a really unfortunate <laughs> nickname if they keep doing this. <laughs> it really is impossible. Um, I think part of this, too, is because a lot of the arguments against being upset about the transgender thing come down to, well, it's not that many people. And why do you care? And, you know, come on. It's, it's so what if a few people have, uh, you know, uh, kind of go down this road? Th th that's true, I, I think. But, like, the issue is it's about truth, right? It's about having yeah. this connection to reality. And, and, and that's really, really important. It's about having these basic guidelines. Like, you, you it feels like it's like... If every person who, you know, wanted to change genders, change genders, it still would probably be a, a pretty small percentage. And and we might be able to shrug our shoulders at that. But it's like it's this idea that we are veering off the main highway here of what's reality. Yeah. And like I feel I feel like we all feel reality slipping away from us. And if we don't step up and say something this obvious is wrong, we're going to lose it entirely. Yeah. I mean, think about what we're being asked to do. We're being asked to. People know this. You, you've got a six foot eight dude with an Adam's apple and you're supposed to call him ma'am. Like, like you're being asked to deny basic reality. And so the, the effect of that is if you're if you can get people to do that on one thing, what what can you get them to lie about to themselves about other stuff that isn't true? And that's the scary. That's the really scary part. When we start denying basic truths as a society, that's that's scary because nobody's in 20 years. Well, I say 20 years. Things happen faster than that. That now, it seems in five years, nobody's going to know what's real and what's not, especially with like deep fake videos and things. I mean, we are going to be really messed up. <laughs> Going on a very odd road very, very quickly. Um, <laughs> let me switch gears over to uh, Nancy Mace. Uh, she's a congresswoman. Yeah. She uh, was at a prayer breakfast, and she told a, you know, a funny anecdote about how she was getting out of bed with her fiancé, and he wanted, to, he wanted a little action, and she decided, no, i got to get to that prayer breakfast. And, you know, it was something that uh, people sort of, some people sort of laughed off. 
uh, some people got upset about it and talked about how, hey, you're at a prayer breakfast. Maybe talking about your premarital sex habits isn't necessarily <laughs> right. The, the right thing to do. I know you talked about this on your podcast, and it was interesting because, like, obviously, like, we all know that, that people, you know, fall down, they make mistakes, they give into temptation all the time. This is you know, more common than I, you know, uh, uh, than, than probably should be when it comes to a, a Christian belief structure. But it was interesting to see the reaction to it. It, it, it's, it almost was like, oh, come on. How can you possibly be upset about a little funny joke like that? Right. I mean, and you talk about being tone deaf. You're somebody who's a professing Christian, which, I mean, we all know what the Bible says about sex and marriage. You're supposed to wait until your marriage. That's the Christian belief, right? Now, I don't know Nancy Mace. I don't know her personal life. I don't care. What I care about is just how we're talking about issues as Christians, as professing Christians that are sin issues. And we can't be flipping about that. Now, um, I, I was more surprised that, like, first of all, just the, to even think that this was a, I mean, like, everybody makes bad jokes, I guess, right? Like, but to think at a prayer <laughs> breakfast that this was going to fly, like, it just makes you wonder where is her head at? <laughs> like, uh, I know a funny joke. We'll talk about having sex with my, uh, you know, fiance at a prayer breakfast for Tim Scott, a professing, you know, Christian. It's just a terrible decision. But all right, let's grant her that and just say, all right, politicians are talking a lot. She made a mistake. Then she goes on one of the night shows and then just makes a joke about it and then moves on. Like, how do you not then at that point when everyone's yelling at you about it, she was getting grief online about it. How do you not at least try to come up with something? I mean, she did say, oh, well, well, I'm a sinner. That's that's why I go to church. Well, you kind of got it right. Like that's <laughs> we don't just go to church to just, or, you know, delete the sins that happen. And then we keep going back to sinning and joking about it. Like that's not what church is for. You're supposed to be changing your life. So, again, I don't know, Nancy Mace. I'm not trying to you know yeah. criticize her. But the fact that politicians are comfortable talking like this the ones who are professing Christians, that's a concern to me. What's, what is the right approach here, Dan, to talk about this stuff to a culture that is so far away from you know, the Christian belief structure on an issue yeah. like this? I mean, there, there's, there, we're talking about a world in which like half the country is arguing it's a human right to be able to end the lives of, of babies in the womb, right? We're talking about a, a, a culture that is saying that, you know, hey, God makes mistakes all the time with gender and we should be able to just <laughs> transfer to, to the yeah. other one whenever we want. This is something that I think a lot of people would look at it and be like, all right, like we got bigger problems, but the church shouldn't abandon its teachings on these things. What is the, how does the right balance to talk to a culture no, I mean, like this? Look, I think the right, I mean, and maybe I'm just a religious zealot, but I think the right balance is you just lean into the truth. You lean into scripture and you just speak the truths. Like I... I don't need any more politicians that are going to try to tell me what they think is popular, right? Like, stop going for what, well, this polls well, so we're going to talk about this. And, you know, we're just going to abandon this principle because the new thing over here polls well. Like, we are modern day Israel, like, just constantly, like, chasing, you know, God strikes, strikes them down when they're worshiping idols. And then 10 minutes later, they're like, oh, hey, look at this over on the high places. We've got some golden calves. This will be great. I mean... That's what we're doing here. And I think Christians should not care if we're not popular. Like, I'm sorry. Just I don't care if the whole rest of everything else is burning down around me. I'm going down on this ship here. I am going for an audience of one. And stop caring about what people think. If it costs you your election, so what? So what? Is that all that matters in your life is winning this seat or being popular? Yeah. I think we just have to stop caring about it. And I honestly, to me, I think that's why people go to church, right? They want to escape this sort of moral relativism that exists everywhere yeah. else in their lives. Yeah. And they go to church and they hear it sometimes there. And I think that's really disconcerting to people. Um, I think it's often uh, a, a part of politics as well, where, you know, this, this stuff happens all the time. People kind of change their uh, foundational beliefs to just kind of go down any road that seems convenient when it comes to the world of politics. I, I don't want to let you go without getting your take on you know, what, what, what went on this week. Obviously, the Trump indictments going on. We've got the Hunter Biden craziness going on uh, as well. What do, you what do you take from the media's reaction to all of this? Well, um, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not entirely surprised by the media. What 
This is how I look at it, though, Stu. I say uh, from a operative standpoint is kind of how I think you have to look at all these things because there's what they want us to be jabbering about. And then there's like what they're actually doing. And in my opinion, and I could be wrong on this, but my sense from covering this stuff for a couple of decades is that this is exactly what Democrats, this is a win-win situation for them. I think on the one hand, if he gets convicted, then great. They've got They've got their opponent convicted of some sort of crime that they you know, conjured up. Mm. But then if, if he's not, he's basically the martyr and they surge him into the primary victory. And I think that Democrats believe Trump is the best chance they have to win reelection, whether it's Biden or somebody else, because the one thing Trump does for Democrats is it galvanizes all the media will be in Trump derangement syndrome. They won't be able to shut up about him. It'll be all Trump all the time. January 6th, stolen election. They'll be call- do all of that stuff. And what will they not be talking about? They will not be talking about how gas is still $4 a gallon. They will not be talking about how I go to the grocery store and I buy three things and it's $48. They won't be talking about how my garbage company now has... Um, inform me to be more efficient. They're going to stop doing recycling every week and only do it every other week, but they're charging me more money. Like these are the sorts of things that are happening all the time and it's infuriating, but the, but none of that will be talked about. Absolutely none of it will be talked about. So nobody will be feeling that. So unless things get really bad, even worse than they are now economically for the average person, I think this is like a win-win, like this is Democrat strategy. We'll see if it works, but I think in their minds, they think it's a win-win. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, when you have a president, Biden, who is unpopular and has not done a great job for the American people, you want that election to, his re-election to be about him, right? You want it to be about Joe Biden. And, you know, if Donald Trump's the nominee, obviously we know how this goes. They're going to be talking about, everyone's going to be talking about Donald Trump. And that's great for the, whatever, 40% of people who are, lined up behind Trump and really love him, and he's going to be very good with those people. But the rest of the people are a problem because these tactics that we complain about all the time, there's a reason they do them, because they're effective, and they work on people in the middle. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I always think elections are decided, Stu, by not the solid Republicans or the solid Democrats. They're not going to get swayed, right? Like the, the, the solid Democrats not voting for Trump in any circumstance, right? The solid Republicans not voting for Biden in any circumstance. It's the fence sitters, the ones that are like, eh, maybe I'll vote this time around. Maybe I won't. They will be galvanized and stirred up into a frenzy because they'll be so afraid of Trump uh, that they'll they'll get off the couch for him, whereas I I don't know that they would for a Ron DeSantis or Tim Scott or somebody else. They're, they're, the average schlub who's kind of a fence sitter voter is not going to be afraid of Tim Scott or Ron DeSantis. I mean, they'll try, but it won't work the same as it does with Trump. So this is this is the strategy that they're trying to implement. I think you're right on that. Uh, Dan Andros, managing editor of FaithWire.com. Be sure to check out his Quick Start podcast and subscribe today. Dan, thanks so much for coming on the program. All right, thanks, Stu. This may shock you, but people don't seem to be looking at the Supreme Court and judging them on their merits. They seem to just be looking at them and saying, hey, when uh, my team is winning, I like them. Uh, here's a new poll. This is er, from, um, uh, let's see, Axios. Republicans used to hate the Supreme Court. Now Democrats do. Okay, let's look at the, the data. And it's, it is kind of hilarious. Right now, 62% of Republicans like the Supreme Court. Only 17% of Democrats do. But you look back at the, the history, you can see Democrats did not like them in, after the 2000 election. It bounced back once Barack Obama, shockingly, uh, got into power. They kind of liked him for a while, and Republicans didn't like him in that period. And in fact, uh, it came uh, came all the way till Donald Trump took over, and then it switched again. And it honestly, the interesting, maybe the most interesting part of this is right around 2020 when Republicans decided they didn't like him either because of uh, their rulings on the election, it would be my speculation there. So that kind of went down for a little bit, but has now bounced back with the positive rulings they've received recently. This doesn't surprise anybody, but it is kind of interesting how this stuff works. And you see the media coverage the same way. The Supreme Court gets loving adoration when Democrats are in charge. And when Republicans are in charge, they are an, an, an ill 
illegitimate institution that's just trying to hamper people's rights. It's exactly what you think the answer would be, but yes, it's true. When your team is winning, you like the Supreme Court. When your team is losing, you don't. If you happen to be one of the, I mean, millions of people who have moved from, let's say, a blue state to a red one uh, over the past few years, you know that when you move into a new area, you don't know anything about the real estate agents in, the, in that area. You might not know the area at all. You better be prepared. And this is still happening. We're still seeing this happen. People by the thousands are still moving from blue states to red states. It is, of course, you know, helping the economy of these red states. Sometimes these state voters aren't voting the way that they probably should, considering they just left a, a liberal catastrophe. But regardless of who, who you are or where you're moving, you need realestateagentsitrust.com. The name kind of says it all. Find the best real estate agent in your area to help you, whether you're buying or selling a home. Get the best price, whether you're buying or selling a home. Go with realestateagentsitrust.com. It's realestateagentsitrust.com. Check it out now, realestateagentsitrust.com. Um, uh, just another phenomenon from the uh, streaming era. Uh, uh, the new hit show is Suits. Suits uh, is, is a big hit now, four years after its run ended. And uh, it's a fascinating story of this show that started out on USA and went for nine seasons on USA and eventually is now moved over to Netflix after a few years. And all of a sudden, it's one of the most popular shows in the country. And it's because it's super bingeable. And it's one of those shows that you, I think, will really like. Now, I got caught up in Suits, I don't know, like halfway through it. And I was watching it on a plane at one point, And I'm like, what is this show? I got locked into the show. And I'll tell you, it's super addicting. I don't know what the, I don't know why it is. But I will tell you, you will care. I got to a point where I cared more about these characters than like most of my family members. <laughs> I can't explain why. It's just really f like fun and well written, and, uh, and and you just wind up really caring about these stupid legal situations. That I mean, look, it is. It's not really how law firms work, but it is really, really interesting uh, to to watch. And you just get really into it. Uh, and I, this is what's happening to people now. A, a couple years after uh, the show ended, Pat Gray started watching it. Then he got really into it, and he couldn't stop watching it. And, you know, people complain. They say it's not realistic. Oh, you know, it's a show. Probably not that realistic. Some people complain, oh, well, it gets repetitive. I mean, how many times can you possibly change uh, the name on the door of the law firm and care about that? I don't know, but every time is my answer. I cared every single time. One of the reasons it's probably popular now is Meghan Markle is in it. She was an actress in the show for, I think, six or seven of the seasons and then, you know, became a princess and left. But the show, I mean, she's part of it and she's, she's good in the show, but the show's great. So if you've got something you want to watch, uh, you want to get into a show that's got a bunch of episodes, it's going to take a while for you to binge, check it out. Suits, it's available on Netflix and a few other places as well. Uh, I, 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 it's, it gets the stew recommendation uh, for wasting your time. We're about three weeks away from the first debate, and uh, I think it looks like six or seven candidates are going to get into this first one. They've just announced the criteria for the second debate, by the way. It's going to be 3% in two national polls, or 3% in one national poll, and 3% in two polls conducted from early states. You're also going to need to get to 50,000 unique donors, and that's only 10,000 donors more than you need to get into the first debate. So you think everybody that's going to get into the first one will probably get into the second one. Long story short, we're going to have lots of debate coverage, of course, here on Blaze. TV and extended coverage of every debate on the Stu Does America YouTube channel. Go there, subscribe now, click the bell for notifications so you don't miss anything. We'll get all the analysis that you need after each and every one of these debates. Coming up, first one, just a couple of weeks.